James says that if you're right in the middle of a trial right now, a testing, a difficult time in your life, that you are to count it all joy. Because what's happening is that your faith is being tested. So let me just read to you from James 1, starting in verse 2. My brethren and my sisters, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying or the testing of your faith works endurance. But let endurance have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire or complete, lacking nothing. Uh, this is a power-packed two verses in the Bible. The first thing that he says is that you can count it joy when you're in a testing. If you know God, and if you, if you know that you know that you know that he causes all things to work together for your good and for his glory. So if you have that confidence, no matter what kind of trial you're in, you can know that even though it's not much fun to be in it, that the end of it is going to be fine. And the thing you've got to remember that what's being tested is your faith. It is the testing of your faith. In the test, we find out if our faith is in ourselves and if we belong to God and our faith is in ourselves. One of the first things that God begins to do is to weaken the strength of our own right arm. You know, we're raised in a society where we're taught to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and God helps those who help themselves. It's amazing how many people believe that's in the Bible, but it's not. But we're taught that, that we're to be self-reliant. And all of these things are totally against the Word. God helps those who know that they're totally helpless. God helps those whose faith is in His faithfulness. So when you're in a test, you're, you're, you're going to see if your faith is in you. And if your faith is in you, you're going to be in some test where you, there's no way you can dig yourself out of this one. And if your faith is in another person, if your faith is in your husband, then God will have to show you that your husband has feet of clay, that he is of the flesh also. If your faith is in your money, your possessions, then our loving Father just has a way of taking those things out of our hands that we're so tightly grasping for our security. Our faith can be in many, many things, in ourselves, in others, in our possessions. If, if your faith is in your position, you know, I have this wonderful job. I'm so fulfilled in my job. Well, guess what you can expect? If you're going to follow God, he's not going to let your security be in your job. Uh, that's where I was when I came to the Lord. I had a career, and I felt very secure in my career. I used to pray, I'd say, oh, God, you can do anything to, you, to me you want to, but please don't ever make me quit work, and I meant in this particular job. But you know what God began to do? He began to just make me not so content with that job. I began to have headaches every day that were just so bad, and doctors couldn't find anything wrong, and an amazing thing happened. I didn't have the headaches when I wasn't on the job. So that which was a big idol in my heart, God just ever so gently removed it. He has such a wonderful way of dealing with his children, just in loving kindness. And what he does before he ever makes any drastic change in our life, he changes our heart to the place where we want that different thing more than anything else. So you can trust him. But, but remember that as you're being tested, whatever trial you're in right now, know that it is the testing of your faith. And God is trying to bring you and me to a place where we endure. Now let's look at what the, the, the and, and the end of enduring is that we'll be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. What does that mean? That means our Christ-like character will have been, become perfected. That as he is, so are we. Now isn't that worth going some, through some trials for? I think it is. And I've, I'm almost 61. I've gone through a few in my life. 
And you know, at the end of every one of the trials, if anything was gone, it was something that had no eternal value, something I didn't need. And I came through the trial, if I did it God's way, wiser, knowing more of Him and knowing more of His ways. So He's no respecter of persons. He'll do exactly the same thing for you that He's done for me, <clears throat> that He's doing for me. I have not yet been perfected, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I'm pressing on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But endurance is, is composed of two Greek words. The first one means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. And this is the word that's used, abide, continue, dwell, endure, remain, stand, and tarry. Then, then the second part of the, the, the second Greek word is under. So it's to stay in a given place, state, relation, under. <clears throat> and the, the Greek word means to stay under or to stay behind or to remain. And I think it's interesting that the remnant means the remaining ones. So, you know, we hear much about the remnant of God, the remnant which is the church. And I believe that what, what this says is that the remnant will be a people who endure. They endure all of the things we're going to talk about for the next two or three sessions in the teaching, the things that we must endure. <clears throat> the verb uh, for endurance, I mean the noun for endurance means cheerful or hopeful endurance. It means constancy. It's used enduring patience or patient continuance. So God is wanting to bring his people to a place where whatever we're going through our attitude is that of cheerful or hopeful endurance. A friend of mine told me recently that, that I used it. She told me this when I was right in the middle of a test. She said, Joyce, you used to teach me to embrace the crosses that came into my life, to embrace the trials. And I said, I did? Well, then I think you need to come and teach me that because I'm not embracing the ones I'm going through very well. But we can, we can know that God will be faithful to us through every trial that we're going through, but he wants our testimony to the world to be that, that we know that this trial, this too, is going to pass. And when it passes, there will be more of Jesus in this earthen vessel and less of me. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 36 tells us a reason why we have to endure. For you have need of of patience, or this really is the word endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Well, first, what is the will of God? The will of God is that I come to the Lord Jesus Christ with every bit of my heart, that I don't hold anything back from him. I come to Jesus. Jesus is continually calling for us. I'm, I'm convinced that the Spirit of God is always hovering over mankind that He created for His pleasure, inviting and drawing Him to Himself. And so the will of God is that we respond to His call. He just wants to love us. He wants to bless us. He made us for His pleasure, and what gives Him pleasure is when we obey Him. So the Spirit of God hovers over us, drawing us, and, and God's will is that we respond to that and that we come to Him and that when we come, we don't hold anything back. We just come with our whole heart. Of course, very few, I think, come initially with our whole heart. We come with as much of our heart as we know. And then I think it's a process of His showing us the different parts of our heart that we haven't given to Him. But God's will is that we respond. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. So his will is that we respond to him, his love and that we come to him and give him our whole heart. And then what he does, you have need of, him, of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, after you have come to him with your whole heart, you might receive the promise. What is the promise? The promise is that I'll be just like Jesus. I will become just like Jesus. But it's through enduring the things that I go through where he's teaching me 
that I become just like Jesus. So I have need of endurance that after I've done my part, and my part is just to come with my whole heart, to keep coming with my whole, whole heart, to continue to give up the idols that he shows me, to continue to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to put to death anger, to put to death impatience, to put to death lust, and that, that I, I continually respond to his love so that I can receive this promise that I'm going to be just like Jesus. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. That's going to happen soon. Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth for his bride, who will have been made pure and holy and without spot and blemish by the trials that, she's got, that she has endured. Now the just shall live by faith. Well, what does that mean? That means that every time I'm going through something, that I live by faith. My faith is in God's faithfulness. My faith is not in my faith. Many people today have faith in their faith. My faith is in God's faithfulness. My faith is in what I know to be God's nature and character, that God never changes. So I live by faith. God sa you say, well, I don't have any faith. God says he's given to every person a measure of faith. Well, how much is a measure of faith? It's all you need to believe. So the just will live by faith. But if any man draws back, and that means to cower or to shrink back. And isn't that the natural thing to do when you're in a test and things are going on that you don't like? Somebody you love is very sick or, or has died. And God is wanting you to live through faith right at that time. But the enemy is accusing God's nature and character to us. The enemy is saying, God doesn't care. God's not going to bring you through this. And so what we begin to do as we hear the enemy accuse God to us, we cower from his presence, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden after they sinned. They were used to walking with God in the garden in sweet fellowship every day. But then rebellion came in, and the fruit of rebellion, which was sin, and then when God came to walk with them, they cowered, they hid because of the sin that was in their life. So God wants us to live by faith. But if any man draw back, shrink back, or cower, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God has no pleasure in him if we're doing anything other than coming boldly to the throne of grace. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to sin unintentionally. I want to tell you, the heart of a disciple is not willful sin. We may fall into sin, but the pattern of our life will not be sin. So God wants us, when we have problems, to come boldly to the throne of grace, and then he'll have pleasure in us. Even though we've made mistakes, even though we're weak, God still has pleasure when we come to the, to boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in our time of need. But the writer of Hebrews says, But we are not of them who draw back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So let's go back to that first verse where God says, <clears throat> You have need of endurance so that you can receive the promise. Uh, let's read in, in Romans um, 4 about Abraham and the promise. The promise to us is exactly the same that it was to Abraham. God called Abraham out of Egypt. Out, not out of Egypt. He called him out of Chaldea, where they worshiped demons, where they were astrologers. And he, he chose Abraham, and he said, I want you to get up, get out, follow me, leave your family. And then he made promises to him. And let's read here in... Um, Romans 4, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth, calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, 
according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now listen to what that passage said that God does. He quickens the dead. Weren't you and I dead in our trespasses and sins when he quickened us and made us alive with him through Jesus Christ? He calls those things which be not as though they were when we were totally unrighteous. He called us righteous. And then in hope against hope, he believed. And listen to this. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now I want us to stop right here just for a minute to think about the parallel between Abraham and us. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, when there was no reason to hope that we would ever be any different, the promise was given to us through Jesus Christ that God would make us a brand new creation who would look just like Jesus. And if we looked at ourselves dead in our trespasses and sins, there's no way we could believe that. But just as Abraham believed, that's the way we believe. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for, for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you see how it was exactly the same with us, that, that God made the same promise to us that he made to Abraham and Sarah? And, you know, Abraham and Sarah waited 12 or 13 years for God to fulfill his promise, and then Sarah, being weak in faith, said, I don't think God's going to come through. Why don't you, we have a child through my handmaiden. And so they had Ishmael. But it was almost 25 years after God gave the promise to Abraham and Sarah that he brought the seed of promise, Isaac. Now, God says that when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're going to become just like Jesus. Now, where most of the church is today, they have not believed. They have not believed that we can be a new, new creation. They have not believed that we can be perfect as, as he is perfect. Just as the children of Israel, uh, when they were supposed to, to go in and take the land of Canaan, they, they sent spies in. God had said, you can possess the land. And they sent in spies who came back and said, no, it is a good land. There's wonderful fruit in the land. But there are giants in the land. And we can't. We can't take the land away from the giants. There were two men, Joshua and Caleb, who said, yes, there are giants in the land, but God said that we could take it so we can take the land. But most of the church has been with the ten spies who believe the bad report. This is the land that God wants us to possess for him today. This is the land, our hearts, that he wants to possess and most of the churches believe the bad reports and, and believe that a person can't live without lust, a person can't live without anger, a person can't live without greed and pride. That's receiving the bad report. The good report is that we stagger not at the promise of God through un unbelief, but being strong in faith, we give glory to God, and we're fully persuaded that what he has promised he is able to perform, and that's when we're righteous. Not when all this is accomplished in our life are we righteous, but we're righteous the minute we believe God. So the reason that, that uh, the writer of Hebrews said, you have need of endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. All right, once again, what is the promise? We're going to be just like Jesus. All of these old things of our old nature are going to pass away, and all things are going to become new. 
Now, which are you going to believe today? Are you going to stagger in unbelief and look at all of this stuff that's still in your life? Or are you going to look at the promise? The minute you believe the promise that God has, has made you, has forgiven all of your sins, has wiped away all of the shame and guilt, that all that was done at Calvary, when you believe that, then that's when God says, right today you're righteous. Today you have a perfect heart before, before me. And I'm going to take care of all these other things in your life that need to be taken care of. Now you're going to have to go through. You're going to have to endure some things. Because it's go, in going through the testings and trials that this excess baggage is going to be loosed from you. God, God works wonderfully with his children. He is so patient. He's not willing that any should perish. He's so long-suffering toward us. And in every one of our lives, he knows exactly what we need to go through in order to be conformed to the exact image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's committed to you and me to let us go through those things, not to destroy us, to destroy our flesh, to destroy our pride, to destroy all of the things that can't go to heaven. But, you know, we need to get our eyes on the eternal perspective anyway. Most of us live just in the here and now and forget that all of this is temporary. It's going to be over soon. And we have an opportunity to, to prepare to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. So why don't we look at it from eternal perspectives? All right, we've seen that we must endure so that we can receive the promise. I want us to look in, in Luke 22 at a promise that Jesus made to Peter. And he makes that same promise to every one of us. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus is saying Satan has demanded permission or has desired to sift you. Satan has desired to put you through some testings and trials. And Jesus agreed to it. But he says, I'm going to be praying for you. Where is Jesus sitting right now? He's at the right hand of the Father doing what? Interceding for you and me as we go through the trials, just as he promised Peter that he would intercede for him. And what was Jesus praying? That Peter's faith fail not, that he would not stagger at the promises of God, but that he would have faith, that God would be faithful to do what he's promised. That's exactly as you're going through trials. Remember, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. And I'm sure there are many, many days when Jesus says to the Father, Father Joyce is just about to faint. Look at her. Will you give her an extra measure of mercy and grace today? And then you know what? It just comes flooding in. And she needs a touch that's more than she's had. And those are the times when the presence of God just floods your heart and mind and soul. And you think, oh, Lord, I'm willing to stay in this fiery furnace for a long, long time if I can have this kind of peace from your presence in the trial. But Peter responded, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He was pretty cocky, wasn't he, before his testing. So are we. We're real sure about what we can endure until those days come when we have to endure. And Jesus said to him, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before you shall deny me thrice you sh thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me and that's exactly what happened and that's exactly what happens to us many many times we deny that we know him by the way that w that we act so we must endure so that we can obtain the promise the promise is that we'll be just like jesus and another reason why we have to endure uh matthew ten twenty two says you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that endures to the end shall be saved. 
uh, Matthew 24, verse 3. The disciples said, Tell us what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. We as disciples are probably asking the Lord that right now. And the answer is there uh, in verse 7. Jesus says, Wars and rumors of wars. Have you ever seen a time when there's so many wars reported in the news in countries that you can't even pronounce and have no idea what continent they're on? Kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. You know, it's an astonishing thing to me that in 20 seconds, God brought such destruction on Kobe, Japan. The best wisdom that men had in building their, their freeways, their superstructures, and God, in one-third of a minute, shook it all down. We're going to be seeing more and more and more of that. And people who are clever say, Mother Nature is angry because people are abusing Mother Nature. God is angry. God is angry that His creation spurns His name. God is angry that His creation have, have created all kinds of gods to serve and worship and refuse Him, the one who created them, for His pleasure. God is angry against sin. And his judgments are being poured out and will be poured out even more on the earth. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Do you know why there are not more Christians that this happens to? So few speak the truth. You know, Christians in China and Russia are persecuted. We will be too as time goes on and as we do not become a part of uh, the popular religious movement, we'll be persecuted too, more and more. Verse 10, Then shall many be offended, and that offended means to entrap, to trip up, to stumble, to entice to sin or apostasy, and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Do you know how the false prophets are deceiving most? by giving them a gospel which tickles their ears, by giving them a gospel which says they can hold on to their life in this world and have heaven too, which is a lie. And because iniquity shall abound, the agape love of many shall wax cold. Why does the love of many wax cold? Because they love sin. Um, or if someone sins against them, their agape love waxes cold because they give in to bitterness and hate and unforgiveness and all of that. Would you not agree that agape love has waxed about as cold as you've ever seen it when children can murder their parents, when children can murder other children, when, when um, there, there's so much cold-bloodedness? There's never been a time that, well, there may have been a time. I haven't always lived, but... Uh, it seems to me that daily the love of many is waxing cold. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. And this gospel, this gospel of endurance and of agape love, the love that will cause people to endure shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations against them if they do not receive a love for the truth. And then shall the end come. This gospel shall be preached in all the world. Is this gospel being preached in all the world? I think not, but it will be. And as soon as this gospel is preached, the whole world, then shall the end come. So we have to endure to the end to be saved. You know, when I used to be a, a, a lost uh, Sunday school teacher in a denomination, I just hated that verse. He who endures to the end will be saved because that was not my doctrine. My doctrine was that if I joined a structure, showed up for all the religious exercises and gave them my tithe, I was saved. I didn't have to endure anything. I, my, whatever my flesh wanted, that's what I gave it. There was no standing against sin. There was no enduring. But I believed I was saved. And so I hated that verse. And, you know, Jesus said it three times in the Gospels just in case... I missed it the first time. He said it three times, that if you endure to the end, you must endure to the end to be saved. So that's another good reason for enduring, isn't it? All right, what do we endure and why? 
Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Isn't that interesting? I endure all things for the elect's sake. Not that they can just be saved, but that they can have the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Romans 8, uh, 16 through 18, Paul said, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be, reve to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Now, I want to read that again. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. See, whatever we're suffering, there's a purpose in it. And that is that, that God's glory will be revealed in us through the suffering. How are the people around you who are unsaved going to know about the faithfulness of God as they see you suffer and they see Christ's glory, which is his nature and character revealed in you? The ones all around you who are living in fear, who are living in torment, who are going through trials and who have no comfort, when they see you and me going through the same kinds of trials and testings and they see the glory of God that is revealed in us, then these sufferings that we are going through are momentary light afflictions. If they are producing that eternal weight of glory in us, I'll tell you, friends, we're going to have to get a different perspective on suffering. And I'm not saying that I like it. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to believe me if I said that I like to suffer. I don't like it any more than you do. But I'll tell you, as I look at it from God's perspective, I see that we have to suffer. We have to suffer in, in, in order to, to learn how to endure. All right, what causes us to be able to endure? 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says that love, agape love, bears all things, believes all things, and endures all things. You know, we don't know much about agape love in our society, do we? Um, this agape love is what will enable and empower us to endure all things. And if we're going to have to endure unto the end to be saved, then we must have some understanding about agape love. What is agape love? Agape love was never known in this world until Calvary. Calvary best says what agape love is. Let me read some of the definitions of it from uh, Strong's and, and Vines. This means to love in a social or moral sense. It denotes deliberate assent of the will. Did you hear that? God's kind of love is a decision. It's a deliberate assent of the will as a matter of principle, duty, or propriety. Agape love means to will to love or to be willing to love. Agape love was never known before Jesus Christ was manifested in the flesh on the earth and walked out this kind of love before us as he suffered and died for the sins of unworthy mankind. Agape love is used to describe God's attitude toward his son. Um, and the scripture reference is John 17, 26. God's attitude toward the human race and particularly his love for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And agape love is used to convey what our attitude is to be toward one another. Uh, agape love is used to express the nature of God. It can, agape love can only be known from the action that it prompts. Agape love is what caused God to send his son to die for us. That was a decision to love us in that way. Uh, agape love is not a complacent or a sentimental love. It's not an emotion or a feeling, as phileo love is. It's a decision. Agape love has nothing to do with the worth of its objects. Obviously, it doesn't, or God wouldn't have loved us when there was nothing lovable uh, about us. 
Agape love has as its perfect expression among men the Lord Jesus Christ. Agape love is one of the fruits, or the fruit, of the Spirit of Christ in us. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is agape love, which produces joy and peace and patience and kindness and meekness and gentleness and goodness and self-control and faith. And I believe that it's agape love which produces all of those things in us. The Spirit of God through agape love. Uh, agape love for God has for its primary object and expresses itself, first of all, in total obedience to God's commandments. If we say we love God and we don't obey his commandments, he says that we're liars. Self-will or selfishness or self-pleasing always negates agape love. Agape love, as used of God, expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being, God, toward entirely unworthy objects. That's us. Producing and fostering a reverential love in them toward the giver and a practical love toward those who are partakers of the same and a desire to help others to seek the giver of this love. Uh, agape love is distinguished from phileo love in that phileo love represents tender affection. In John 21, uh, 15 through 17, Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, do you agape love me? And Peter was saying, I have a tender affection for you. And twice Jesus said, do you agape love me? And Jesus is, uh, Peter said, I have a tender affection for you. And then Jesus says, do you have a tender affection for me? Feed my sheep. But you know, I think that Peter had to go through some things before he could understand what agape love was. I think you and I have to go through some things before we can understand what it is. But we have to have this agape love which comes from God through what Jesus Christ did at Calvary in order to be able to endure if not in any rela if 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 you're in a marriage and your mate is uh, shall we say less than perfect, if you only have a, a, a sexual love toward that mate when the going gets rough, you're not going to stick with it. If you o only have a sentimental love toward him, when the going gets toward her, when the going gets tough, you're going to bail out. But if you have agape love, agape love is is love that God gives us for others where you don't love somebody because they do good or do bad. You love them because you love God and God loves you and you love them. I'll tell you what, if we don't have a revelation of this love which comes only from Jesus, then we're not going to make it in any of our relationships because people are going to disappoint us. People are going to hurt us. God is the only one who never will fail us, never will leave us nor forsake us. But the way he makes his nature and character known to others is as people in whom there's no reason for you to love them, you love them. There's no explanation for it. It's a totally supernatural thing. That's God's kind of love. And that's the, that's the primary way that we evangelize this world is through loving people in that way. You and I can't do it. We can't work it up. The biggest mess you ever see is when you try to work up agape love for somebody. All you do is get into a big mess, a flesh mess of trying to save people a lot of times when God's not saving them. But I'll tell you, when it's God's love, he pours it out through you. And when, when someone is to be a recipient of it, you can't help but just love them exactly the way that Jesus does. Not trying to control them but just loving them just the way they are, not demanding that they change before you love them, loving them right where, where they are. That's exactly the way Jesus came to us. He loved us when there was nothing lovable about us, didn't he? He came to you when you were a sinner and when you desired nothing except to keep sinning. He came to you and began to draw you with that agape love. That's what he did with me. And that's how he wants us to be out in this world. When people, you know, some of the 
crankiest, most hateful people in the world. He, he wants us to be constant in our loving them and not responding, not retaliating with them, but just loving them. Because so many of these people have been so hurt. They are totally cynical. They're totally without hope in this world. And of all people, most miserable. And God has set some of these people around you. And you know what you're doing? You're responding just like they are, just as cranky and hateful and hard to get along with as they are. That's not what God's purpose is. And you're tormented in those relationships. And you can't love the way Jesus loves in your flesh. And you know what? All you can do is just be a willing vessel, a willing receiver of his love to give it out. You know, if you, don't, if you receive God's love and you don't give it out, it, you become a stagnant pond. So he gives us that love to give out. And you don't ever know when he's going to want to just, for you to slosh his love all over somebody. So that's why every day we have to just have our hearts right, have our attitudes right. And then as we go, we're just filled with the Spirit of God. And when he chooses to reach out and love somebody... You're just amazed at how much he loves them. And then you go, go on because it's him who's doing it. You don't get puffed up in how much you can love because you know that he's the one who's loving through you. Paul says that we're to pursue love. 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, flee selfishness and covetousness and greed, and follow after or pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. God says we're to pursue love. That means that we're not passive about it. That, that we, we fight the good fight of faith and, and lay hold to those things which were given to us through what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. We can't be passive in, in this race that we're in. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after or pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. And Colossians 3, 14, he says, above all these things, put on agape love, which is the bond of perfectness. Agape love makes us complete and whole and nothing else will. Receiving that agape love from, from God through Jesus Christ is what will make us whole, what will make us complete. Do you know that most of the sin in your, your life and mine comes from areas where, we're not, where we haven't been made whole? Let me just use rejection as a small example. If you still have fear of rejection and lust for approval, then what will happen to you is that in every relationship that you have, you'll be doing things because you're lusting for that person's approval. And you know what? God will never let you get their approval. As long as you lust for it, then he won't let you have it because you would make an idol of it. And so until you let Jesus Christ reveal to you how much he loves you and how he accepts you just the way you are, that you don't have to earn his approval, you don't have to earn his love. And, and when you let him, when you cry out to him and pursue that love and he reveals to you how much he loves you, then that is the bond of perfectness. It's the thing that will make you whole so that then you're free to just love people the way they are. You don't have any strings. You're not trying to control them. You're loving them just the way they are. That's what God wants in every relationship. Parents with children, he wants you to love your children just the way you are. He wants you to remove from them the yokes of performance that you've put on them. It's amazing to me how many children believe that their parents don't love them unless they perform in a certain way. Uh, parents, you need. Agape love says, I, I, I love you just the way you are. Uh, you don't have to perform for me. I love you when you're good and I love you when you're bad. Now, I want you to pursue righteousness, but I love you just the way you are. I'll tell you, that would release such yokes from your children. You know, most of the men in, that I deal with in prison believe that their parents were, so many of them don't even have a, a father or a family. So many of them are, were illegitimate. But the ones who are there who had parents, without exception, they say, I felt like I could never please my father. I felt like nothing I ever did was good enough. 
if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, release those around you from the yokes that you've put on them, that you have to be a certain way or I won't love you. You have to let me control you totally or I won't love you. See, agape love is not like that. Agape love just loves, period. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And God's love can only rule in your heart when you're walking in agape love. I want to tell you, if anything else is there, if there's any, any anger, if there's any bitterness, if there's any unforgiveness, if there's any control, manipulation, if there's lust, if there are any of those things in your heart, the love of God can't rule in your, uh, the peace of God can't rule in your heart. Let the peace of God rule in your heart by walking in agape love, to the which you were also called, and be ye thankful. Second Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of God, the agape love of God constrains us, and that means it holds us together in completeness. The, the, the love of God, the agape love of God constrains us in lots of ways. The agape love of God keeps us from doing a lot of things that we would otherwise do. The love that he has for us that we've received and then the love we have for other people. It's a great restraint or constraint on our life. When people are out of control, it means that, that God's love is not, is not restraining them or constraining them. When a man leaves his wife for another woman, you can believe that the love of God is not operating in his life. I don't care what he's saying. He is living totally in selfishness and self-centeredness. When a wife, when a mother leaves her husband and children, she's op she, she doesn't know agape love. Agape love is that decision to stay in that marriage even though it's not perfect. Agape love is, to, is a decision to love those children even though they're not performing in any way that, the way that you expect them to. Agape love is loving because God loved us. <clears throat> Now, the end of the commandment, this is 1 Timothy 1, 5, the end of the commandment or the purpose of the teaching is agape love out of a pure heart. The only way that we're going to be able to walk in agape love is with a pure heart. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but agape love edifies, and that means to be a house builder. Agape love will build up your household, will build up the household of God. Romans 13.10, love work, agape love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, agape love is the fulfilling of the law. The only way you're going to be able to fulfill God's laws is to walk in agape love. Hebrews 10.24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. All right, another thing agape love does, it protects our heart. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Faith and love protect our heart. And for a helmet to protect our mind, the hope of salvation. Remember that we have to endure to receive the promise. That promise is the hope of salvation. Paul speaks of the breastplate of faith and love. Because the right kind of faith will only work with the right kind of love. And, and the wrong kind of faith causes us to pray selfishly and self-centeredly. You think about that. The wrong kind of faith. You can have faith that God's going to give me a Cadillac or God's going to give me uh, a different husband or whatever. But all that praying is selfishness and self-centeredness. Agape love causes us to pray that God's will will be done. Galatians 5, 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but only faith which works by love. Faith works by love. If we're not walking in agape love, then our heart condemns us and we can't have faith in God or in others. And we're going to be looking at some of the um, attributes of agape love. And remember, the reason that we're looking at agape love is because we're talking about endurance. The only way we're going to be able to endure what we go through is if we're walking in agape love. Agape love sacrifices and suffers and dies. 
1 Peter 1, 18 through 22, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things <clears throat> as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, that's unpretended, love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Then verse 20 and 21, For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you shall bear it patiently? This is First Peter 2, verse 20. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. First Peter 4, 1 and 2, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Hebrews 5, 8, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of, of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him by suffering too. So if you're going to love the way that Jesus Christ loved you and me, then you're going to make up your mind that you're going to suffer. And Peter says, so what if you suffer and when you're doing wrong and you take that patiently? What good is that? It's when you suffer, when you're mistreated, when you're abused, when you, if you suffer, when, when uh, things are, are going badly for you, when, if you suffer the right way, then that's when you get the blessings of God. You know, most of us suffer much of the time, but most, most of our suffering is for the wrong reason. I've known many, many women who were in marriages where they felt like they were suffering. But you know, a lot of their suffering was from their own rebellious heart that was just in contention all the time, just in strife all the time. Jesus wants us to suffer in the right way for the right reason. And if, if Jesus Christ suffered in the flesh, we can arm ourselves likewise with the same mind because if we're going to cease from sin, we're going to have to suffer. Well, how does that work? As we suffer, God puts us in situations where we can see what's in our heart. And you know what's in most of our hearts most of the time? Grumbling, rebellion, pride, anger, self-pity. So we can suffer for the wrong reason or we can suffer for the right reason. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to train us in righteousness so that we're suffering for the right reasons. Now, when, when the next time a trial comes along, I want you to listen to what comes out of your mouth. And what comes out of your mouth is exactly what's in your heart. Now, if, grum, if, if, if you're put in a place where you're suffering and, and grumbling comes out, guess what? That's because grumbling is what's in your heart. If, if you're in a situation where you're suffering, and anger and unforgiveness comes out. May I just tell you that there is not one person in the whole world who can make you angry. You say, well, you don't know my husband. No, it's not your husband who's making you angry. The anger is in your heart. God is only using your husband as an instrument of righteousness to squeeze you, to show you the anger that's in your own heart. Then what do you do when you see it? You repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't know that anger was there. Will you please forgive me? And will you please remove it? You know, when most people suffer, do you know one of the, the main manifestations that comes out is self-pity. Why me? Why do I have to go through this? And you look around, the enemy shows you all the people around you who are prospering and who are not suffering. 
I'm telling you that Jesus wants through our suffering to teach us, to bring us to a place where we're not wallowing in self-pity, but every time we're in a situation where we're suffering, we let him come as our comforter. And you know, some of the things that you're going through right now, down the road you'll see that God is equipping you to minister to many, many people whom you couldn't minister to because you can only comfort those with the comfort wherewith you have been comforted. And so you can either receive from the enemy the weapons of of anger and unforgiveness and bitterness and grumbling and self-pity and all those things, or you can receive the comfort of the comforter. And I'm telling you that when you're suffering, he's just waiting for you to cry out to him that you need comfort. And when you cry out to him, that's a cry that he will never, ever refuse. Um, I'll tell you what happens with most people when they're in a situation where they're suffering. The enemy comes and begins to tell them how unfair God is and that God is angry with them. And so then they get angry with God. So if you're suffering today, may I just tell you that Jesus Christ suffered more than any person when he died on the cross for you. He suffered for you. And he understands all of the feelings of your afflictions, and he so wants to come and comfort you in your suffering. And remember that in your suffering, he's trying to perfect in you agape love so that you can endure all things because it is the one who endures to the end who will be saved. You say, well, I thought Jesus did it all at Calvary. He did. He did everything at Calvary that is needed for your salvation. But he intends to bring us to heaven, having equipped us on the way. And so what he's, the way he's equipping us is through testings and trials, which are producing in us an eternal weight of glory, which is his nature and character, which is his testimony to the world around you about his faithfulness. So receive grace from him. Receive mercy from him. And every trial, at the end of every trial, you'll look back and you'll look more like Jesus than you look like you. Praise God for his faithfulness to his body, which he is conforming to the exact image of himself. God bless you. Hi, I'm Joyce Green. We're continuing to talk about endurance. And James 1, 4 says that endurance will have a perfect work in us, that after we have endured for a while, we will be perfect and complete, our whole lacking nothing. And we, in the previous teaching, talked about agape love, that agape love endures all things, and and we have to have agape love in order to be able to endure, and that that kind of love only comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved us perfectly with agape love to die for us, and, and he loves us daily with that kind of love, and he fills us with that kind of love so that we can reach out to others. And the first thing we looked at about agape love is that agape love is what will cause us to suffer for the right reasons and in the right way. And the next thing we want to look at is that agape love covers. I I want you to think about Genesis 9 where God had just used Noah in a mighty way to build an ark to save uh, those who would come up on the ark. And then after that time, uh, Noah built, uh, planted a vineyard and made wine, and he got drunk. And I don't, I'm not sure what, um, what all is meant when the scriptures say that he was uncovered in his tent, but obviously he was in some kind of uh, sin. His, his flesh was showing, as all of us, as all of us in the body of Christ at some time or another, we've been in the flesh in some things. And Noah had three sons, and one of his sons 
pointed his finger at his father's sin, at his father's nakedness, and told the other two brothers. And the other two brothers backed up to their father with a garment and covered their father's nakedness. And when, when Noah knew what had happened, he said that um, um, Ham, his son, who pointed the finger and, and accused, that his uh, children would be cursed with a curse. And that's exactly the way it is today. God is looking for people who will cover with agape love. Uh, Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Proverbs 17, 9, He that covereth a transgression seeks love, but he that repeats a matter and uncovers separates very friends. 1 Peter 4, 7, and 8, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Matthew 5, Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Jesus is speaking to his disciples as he's speaking to us today. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of your eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? You hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Jesus was very, very clear that we're not to judge one another. To judge is to pass a sentence on, and, and judgment is harsh. Now, that's not to say that we, as the body of Christ, will not have discernment, because we will have. Discernment is different than, than judging. Um, I think when you judge, there is absolutely no agape love, and you're passing a sentence on someone. But God wants a body of people who will cover one another, who will let agape love cover the sins. Well, does that mean that we say that everything's okay that anybody does that's wrong? No. No, we're not the judge. We, the, the Word has passed a judgment on what's right and what's wrong and what the results of sin will be. Uh, a church that Uh, Milton and I were in once, the treasurer of the church, a very public man, was involved in adultery. And when Milton went to talk to the pastor about this man in a position of leadership being in adultery, the pastor said, well, we're just going to have to love him. But do you know that love is truth? Love is obeying the word. And you don't let someone continue in sin uh, when they're in a position of leadership in the church or when they're in the church. You deal with sin. That is love. We have such a false idea of what love is today. And, and you know what began to happen in that church as the young people, this man had a teenage daughter, and, and of course she knew that he had a girlfriend and was, was in immorality, but that curse of immorality just spread on the whole church. God doesn't, God is the judge, and he doesn't want us to cover with a false love what is wrong, but we're not the judge. See, our attitude toward, toward um, a person who's in sin is that we love them, but only the truth will help someone if they're in that situation. Romans 14, 4, Paul, the, God said through Paul, who, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, yea, and he, he shall be held up, or now he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, I want us to read that, where it's the prophecy about when Jesus would come. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Do you know that the government of your life and the government of everybody else's life is on Jesus Christ's shoulder? It's when we take the government upon our shoulder for another person's life that we really get in trouble. I remember several years ago, a, a minister from California came to one of Milt's meetings, and 
when I first saw him, he was totally bent over, almost a 45 degree angle, his face toward the ground. When he first came to the meeting, I thought it was, was a deformity from, from birth. And the next time we saw this man, he was standing upright. And this is the story that he told us, that as a pastor, he had had three elders to take a church away from him. And he had such unforgiveness and bitterness toward him that his body gradually became all bent over like that. And as he, he came to, to the meeting and repented, he went back home and he went to see the first elder and said, I forgive you. And he straightened up a little bit. He went to see the second elder and said, I forgive you. He was removing the judgments he had placed upon them. He straightened up a little bit more. And by the time he went to see the third one to say, I forgive you, then he was walking upright. The government for our life and for the lives of others is on God's shoulder. All we can do when we see brothers and sisters overtaken in a sin, we can pray for them. If God tells us to go to them, then we can go to them in a spirit of meekness, knowing that we're subject as they are to that sin. And if we go in arrogance, if we judge them, then according to God's righteous judgment, whatever is on them will come on us. If we ever, as the church of God, learn what God's righteous judgment is, it will put more fear of God into us than anything else I know. And God's righteous judgment is very simple. Whatever you judge somebody else for, that very thing will come back on you. How many mothers, um, how many young ladies do you know who have judged their mothers? And then as they see themselves getting older, they see exactly the same traits in them. They see them treating their children in exactly the same way that their mother treated them and that they hated so much. How many young ladies who judged their father made harsh judgments? They wind up marrying a man just like their father. God says, I'm the only righteous judge. I'm the only judge. I'm the only one who knows the beginning from the end. I'm the only one who knows why a person acts the way they do. I'm the only one who knows what they've gone through in their lifetime that causes them to be a certain way. I'm the one who knows the end from the beginning. And I'm the only righteous judge. I'm the only one with all of the facts. And I did not call you to be a judge. I have forbidden you to judge. I want you, whatever the circumstance, I want you to let agape love cover. Let agape love believe, believe the best in every situation. And God says, I'm the judge. I'm the only righteous judge. All I've called you to do is cover with love. We as a church have failed so miserably in this area because Jesus said in his, his prayer right before he was crucified that the way that people would know that we were his is by the way we loved one another. And you know, the, the, the church shoots the wounded the only army in the world that kills the wounded. But God is trying to bring us to a place where we cover those who are wounded with his love. And then he can bind up their broken hearts as we just pour out his agape love on them. The next thing I want us to look at is that love gives. Deuteronomy 7, starting in verse 12 through 15. Wherefore it shall come to pass, this is God speaking to his people, if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee, the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swore unto thy fathers. Now this is God giving, and he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb, he'll bless your children, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you. Isn't that a wonderful promise? I've seen so many barren women who became fruitful because of God's goodness. A curse of barrenness is on many, many women, and God removes that through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm, I'll be in India soon, and one of the worst things that can happen to an Indian woman is that she would be barren. And the last time I was there, three years ago, I prayed for many of them. I'm so eager to go back, believing that many of them are going to have babies that are 
two years old. But God has promised that there will not be any male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate you. God gives. God wants to bless. All we have to do to receive God's blessings is just line up with his word. God is a giver. God proved that he was a giver in giving us his most precious gift, his son. And he desires, because of agape love, to give and give and give to you and me. All our part is, is to hearken, to hear and obey God's word, to keep and do his commandments. And you know, we can't even do that. That's why we need a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we come to Jesus with our whole heart, then he comes to live inside of us through his Holy Spirit. He writes the Ten Commandments on our heart and gives us the Holy Spirit to walk those commandments out so that they're not burdensome, they're grievous. And in response, in response to his love and giving us his son, then we can respond by showing our love to him by being obedient. And then he responds to our loving him in obedience by blessing us, by pouring out blessings over and over and over on us and on our children. There's no more barrenness in our life. There's only fruitfulness because he loves us. And he is our healer, and he will put none of the diseases of Egypt on us because he loves us, because he's the giver. I can't tell you how many times during this past winter as there have been so many viruses on so many people, and I would feel one coming on me. You know, there's a certain point when you can feel it right in here that it's about to come. And so many times, just in humility, I have read the Lord this verse. Lord, you say that if I will obey you, if I will keep and do your commandments, and I'm doing the best I can, Lord, you promised that you would put none of the diseases of Egypt on me. And Lord, I'm just humbly and meekly asking you to watch over your word to perform it because I don't even feel like being in spiritual warfare over this thing. I just need you to keep your word to me. And you know what? He's faithful. He has rolled back those diseases of Egypt so many times because of his faithfulness. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. There's no life apart from life in Jesus Christ. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation are the covering for our sin. God covered our sins, and he wants us to cover the sins of others. James 2, 14 through 17, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith, hath faith and hath not works of agape love? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works of agape love, and that agape love I put in is dead, being alone. The proof that you have faith is that you're going to be, faith works with love and love works with faith. So if you have faith in God, you're going to be walking in agape love. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul tells the church that they're abounding in gifts of faith and utterance and knowledge, but they, that they need to prove their love. They need to prove that love is working in them by giving, as the church in Macedonia gave, out of deep poverty with rich liberality. Agape love always gives with no thought of a return for the expression of the love that was given away. So let me ask you, are you a giver? Are you giving out the agape love that God has given you? That's why he gives it to us. Well, he gives it to us because he delights in giving us good gifts. But he does not give us the love to consume up on our own lust. He gives us his love to give away. 
All right, another thing that love does, love cleaves or is glued to. In Genesis 2, 23 and 24, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall his, a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave, shall be glued to his wife and they shall be one flesh. That's a great mystery, what God does in a marriage. It's similar to the mystery. It's the same mystery as Jesus Christ and his bride, how we become one with him. Deuteronomy 11, 22 through 25. For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to cleave unto him, to be glued unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourself. Where is the place that the Lord is wanting to drive out the nations? Right here on our heart. He's wanting to drive out the nations of anger and hate and murder and, and lust, fear. All of these are enemies on this land. All of these enemies are stealing the fruit that Jesus wants to produce in our land. So God says that if we will cleave to him, if we'll be, we'll be glued to him, then he's going to drive these enemies off. Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Did Jesus say that we would tread upon serpents and scorpions and have authority over all the power of the enemy? Well, this is that prophetic word in the Old Testament. If we will diligently keep the commandments and do them, if we will love the Lord and if we will be glued to him, then he's going to drive out all of these enemies. Verse 25, there shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he has said unto you. Instead of our living in fear, the enemy fears us, because the enemy knows that we know that we have authority over him. Psalm 63, 8 says, my soul follows hard, and that means to cleave, to catch by pursuit after thee. That's how the Lord wants us to be. He wants us, he wants to have a bride who is passionate in her love for him. He wants to have a bride who follows hard after, who cleaves, who catches by pursuit him. Can you imagine anything worse than, than a man marrying a woman who is totally noncommittal and casual and unconcerned about their relationship? Every man who marries a bride wants a bride who is passionately in love with him. The Lord Jesus Christ wants his bride to passionately love him, forsaking all, all, all other lovers. I want to be that kind of bride, don't you? I want everything in this world to just get dimmer and dimmer to me as I look toward him, as I behold his face. Because he's all that's worthwhile to have. Love is loyal. You know, there's not much loyalty in the world today. That's why people can walk out of a marriage after 29 or 30 or 35 years. It's because there's no loyalty. But agape love is loyal. Agape love is what will make a woman stick by a man even though he goes through hard days. He, he may be an alcoholic or he may be all sorts of things, but loyalty will cause her to believe that one day God's going to change him. Amen. In Ruth 1.16, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Uh, Numbers 25, 1 through 15, Phineas was loyal to God as he used a javelin on an Israelite man and a Midianite woman who were in their morality. God is looking for people who will be loyal to him. He's looking for people who will take up his cause. And, and you know, there are many causes today, but the cause God wants us to take up is this word right here. You can get caught up in all sorts of political causes and, and good things. And God may have called some to do that. 
But I want to tell you that proclaiming this word and living this word out is the cause that he's wanting his people to be committed to. Malachi 2, verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and Jerusalem and the church. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and has married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offers an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this you've done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regards not your offering anymore or receives it with good will at your hand. Yet you say, why? Why is God not hearing my prayers? Because the Lord's been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously. I want to tell you, God does not like it. The adultery that is going on, the bro breaking up of homes, of marriages, uh, you know, among ministers, they, they, they leave their wives and, and, and go to another woman and believe some, lie, some demonic lies in their mind that God has anything to do with it. God says, he's a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you dealt, have dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion, the wife of the covenant? And did he not make you one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit? And wherefore, why did he make you one? That you might have godly seed. How else are you going to have godly seed? Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hates divorce. If you don't remember one thing else from this program, you remember that God says, I hate divorce. For one covers violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. For you've wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say that everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, or he delights in them, or where is the God of judgment? God says we weary him with our words when a man puts away his wife. And we say it's all right with God. It's not all right with God. And God says that you deal treacherously when you do that. And God is looking for people who will be loyal to him. And if we're loyal to him, we'll be loyal to the ones he's placed around us. Amen? The love of Christ constrains us. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ controls, and this is the Amplified, for the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us because we are of the opinion and conviction that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that all those who live might live no longer to and for themselves, but to and for him who died and was raised again for their sake. Consequently, <coughs> from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view, in terms of natural standards of value, <clears throat> no, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man, yet now <coughs> we have such knowledge of him that we know, know him no longer in terms of the flesh. Therefore, if any person is engrafted <clears throat> in Christ the Messiah, he is a new creature altogether, a new creation. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. But all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, that by word and deed we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. So the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ keeps us from doing a lot of things that we would do otherwise. The agape love that makes us, because he loved us so much, then we want, we desire 
to lay down our lives by loving others. We're constrained from doing things that the world does. We're constrained from doing things that other people seem to have a freedom to do because the agape love of Christ constrains us. All right, the next thing I want us to look at is that love endures. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says that love endures all things. Jeremiah 31, 3, The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness I have drawn thee. In the Song of Solomon, uh, Solomon says, Love is as strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly disrespected. And I want to read to you Isaiah 49. If you ever doubt that God loves you, I want you to have this passage marked, Isaiah 49, uh, starting in verse 14. But Zion said, the church has said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. How many times have you thought that? How many times have you believed that, that God has utterly forsaken you, has utterly forgotten you? God knew it would happen. And this is what he said. Can a woman forget her, her sucking child or her nursing child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have engraved thee on the palms of my hands at Calvary. Thy walls, the walls of protection and salvation, are continually before me. God says, because of agape love and that love enduring, that he will not forsake you, that he has not forgotten you. You know, much of the time when we feel like God has forsaken us, we've just been disappointed in him. You know, he didn't answer some prayer the way that we wanted it answered. We really prayed in faith, believing that God was going to answer our prayer in a certain way, and he didn't answer it that way. And we felt rejected by him. And then we were disappointed. I was in the prison uh, right before Christmas, and a young man who's a leader there, just a fine young black man named Andrew, um, he said, I need to talk to you. And I made an appointment to come back and talk to him the same day. And he said, I don't know what's happened. He said, uh, I just want to give up. He said, I'm doing all the same things I've done before, but it's just perfunctory. It's just there's, there's nothing in it. And the Lord had me ask him, Andrew, have you been disappointed in God? And God showed him instantly. He said, yes. He said, um, I, I put in a writ, which was a thing that his case would be reviewed. He said, you know, my wife's getting out of nursing school uh, this month, and I, I'm just afraid that she won't wait for me for three more years. And I so hoped I would get out of prison. And uh, I was turned down. And I guess I got mad at God because he didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted him to. And Andrew, because he's a disciple, he saw the sin. He saw the lack of faith. He saw that because he could not manipulate God to answer his prayers his way, that he just was pouting. But he repented. And God restored to Andrew the joy of his salvation. Many of you who are watching, the same thing has happened. You really prayed that God would restore a marriage. Or you really prayed that someone you loved wouldn't die. You have really prayed for a child who's in rebellion. Your prayer hasn't been answered the way that you wanted it to be answered. And you've listened to the lie that God doesn't love you. That God's not faithful to you. But if God never does one more thing for you and me than he did when he gave Jesus to die at Calvary, that is proof enough of his agape love to you and me. But he's done so much more than that. He does so much more than that daily. So God is loyal to you in his love, and he, his love endures. Whatever you're going through, his love is enduring. 2 Corinthians 13, 8, agape love never fails. 
a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine called, and I, I don't see her much anymore, but, but I said, um, tell me, how's your husband? She said, Joyce, you told me seven years ago that agape love never failed, and I have loved him that way, and I want you to know God is giving me the marriage that I always dreamed about having. At the time I told her that, the husband was involved in an adulterous relationship. There didn't seem to be much hope for the marriage. But God caused her to be steadfast in agape love. And God has given her the desire of her heart because of his faithfulness. Now abides or remains, or continues. Faith, hope, and agape love, these three, but the greatest of these is agape love. Hosea is a book in the Bible that tells about a man who married a harlot and continually went and got her and brought her back from harlotry to himself because of agape love. And God had Hosea to do that. Hosea was a prophet, and God had him to do that, to show us. It's a perfect picture of God's agape love for us. We have continually strayed away from God. We have continued uh, many times with other lovers. We have loved this world and the things in the world. We have loved the possessions and the positions and the people of the world more than we've loved God. And God says in, in um, Hosea 4, verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwells therein shall languish with the beast of the field, with the powers of darkness, and the fowls of heaven. Yet let no man strive, nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. That's, what, that, that's the situation in most of the church today. Let nobody strive. All this adultery and lying and stealing is going on, but don't let anyone strive. For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in that day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. I will destroy the church. And then God says one of the saddest things, my people are destroyed, are cut off for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? Lack of knowledge of this word. Lack of knowledge of God's ways. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God. I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity, and there shall be like people like priests. Can I just tell you what that is? We had a, I had a pastor once who used to say that a church takes on the personality of the pastor. Well, this pastor, uh, we discovered later, was in, in immorality. We discovered it because two women who, that he was in immorality with came to my husband and I and told us. My husband did according to the word and took the word and went prayerfully to the pastor. And the pastor didn't change. So guess what? The church became like people like priests. That spirit of immorality spread throughout the church. And on every level, among the deacons, among, among Sunday school teachers, among the young people, they shall be like people like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. And they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they've left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away their heart. My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declares unto them, for the spirit of whoredom has caused them to err. This is exactly what's happened in most of the churches today. A spirit of whoredom has caused them to err. 
to err, and they have gone a whoring from their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills. Therefore, your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. Another place he says, set the trumpet to thy lips. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. God says they've set up kings, but not by me. These flesh kings that control God's people, it's not by God. They've made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols that they may be cut off. They have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It has no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If it be so, the stranger shall swallow it up. He's saying there's no fruit in the land. He says, I've written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it. You want me to tell you what that means? They sacrifice the flesh and then eat it. They give their money to have padded, padded pews to sit on so, they, so they'll be comfortable, comforted during their 30-minute sermonette. They sacrifice the flesh and eat it. They give money to God and build themselves family life centers for them to... They build health clubs for them to exercise. If some churches even have restaurants in their health club. They sacrifice the flesh and eat it. They, they sacrifice the flesh and eat it. They spend their money for the... the they give money to God for the, the young people to take luxurious trips. People the world over are dying for the gospel. And the people who are called by God's name sacrifice the flesh and then eat it. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat them, but the Lord accepts them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins, for they shall return to Egypt. They will return to the world. For Israel has forgotten his maker. The church has forgotten God and builds palaces. Isn't that exactly what it's doing? And Judah has multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities. What, what's the city that we're to be in? The city that God's building, Right. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Verse, uh, chapter 9 of Hosea, verse 15. All their wickedness is at Gilgal. You know what happened at Gilgal? That's when they first appointed a king. God had said to them, I want you to have judges who will judge righteously by my law. But the Israelites said, we want a king so we can be like all of the nations around us. We want a king that we can see to lead us out in battle. Now, God had been doing a pretty good job of leading them out in battle and defeating their enemies when they were right with him. But they said, we want a king that we can see. We want a king to lead us out in battle. And God said to them, through, through Saul, he said, if you have a king, he'll make you slaves. If you have a king, he'll take all your money and all your possessions. If you have a king, he'll take your children captive. And they said, no, but we want a king. And God says, all their wickedness is at Gilgal. That's when they had their first king. For there I hated them. Do you know it's no different today? God still hates it when his people have flesh kings that they're submitted to and don't submit to him. For the wickedness of their doing, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. Isn't that sad? Chapter 10, verse 1, Israel is an empty vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. That's what most of the church does. It's not fruit for God. It's not fruit for, to, for lost people in the world. It's fruit for themselves. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, have they made their images the more money they have, the bigger the structures are, the bigger the sacred, the, the big pillars are out front. God says their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He will break down their altars. He will spoil their images. For now they shall say, we have no king because we feared not the Lord. What then could a king do for us? 
Verse 12, sow to yourself. This is God's answer to what's going on. Sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Let your heart be broken because there's no love of God and there's no love for others in your heart. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. This passage always just breaks my heart. When Israel was a child, when the church was, was a baby, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. That's what he did. He called us out of the world. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Baal and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also how to walk, taking, him by, taking them by their arms. But they knew not that I was the one who healed them. I drew them with cords of a man and with bands of love. I was to them as they that take off the yoke off their jaws, and I laid meat upon them. Verse 7, And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. First, chapter 14, verse 1, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so we will render the fruit of our lips. Asher, or, which means success, shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, and horses is a picture of the flesh, and, and most of the, what goes on in much, many of the churches is just flesh that they're riding on programs. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods. For in thee the fatherless finds mercy. God says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. Verse 9, who is wise, and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. So God loved Israel even when she was backsliding, and God drew Israel back to him with cords of love. That's exactly, I don't know where you're walking today, but you know. Have you had other gods? Have you made idols of the blessings of God? Have you received blessings from God and then turned them into idols? Have you received the children he gave to you as blessings, to be blessings, and then you've made them idols in your heart? Have you received financial blessings from God and then all of your hope and trust is in those financial, that financial security? Where is your hope and trust? God is saying to you, I've loved you freely. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Why don't you turn from your backslidings and return to me, and I'll heal you. You see, eh, the only condition he puts out there is just return, just repent. Let me break up the fallow ground, which is your heart. And, and change you and save you. God loves us with an everlasting love, with an enduring love. I want us to begin to look at some things that we must endure if we're going to be saved. And the first thing that we have to endure is sound doctrine. Second Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables or myths. What are some of the uh, myths that people have received today that will cause them not to endure? Uh, one myth is the eternal security of the unbeliever. Uh, many people believe that because they've joined a religious structure, some kind, some church, and because they've said they believe the words, I believe on Jesus Christ, then they're encouraged to believe that they're saved even though there's no fruit of salvation that ever manifest in their life. Uh, that, that's a doctrine that will cause you to fall away and not even, not even know what has happened to you. Uh, Jesus has a plan for mankind. That plan is that we receive by faith the gospel and that we come to him 
with our whole heart, a totally supernatural transaction takes place where he comes to us, writes his laws on our heart, empowers us to walk them out. And I want you to know I can be sure that I am eternally secure. Do you know why? Because I have, Jesus Christ came to me, I received him, and I met the conditions of the gospel. It's a covenant relationship where he gave us everything pertaining to life and godliness through what he did at Calvary. But in a covenant relationship, I have a part too. My part is to receive what he did and to walk in the benefits of covenant. So don't receive a false security because you're a part of a church. If you are not walking in repentance and if you are not daily being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you need not have any false assurance that you're all right. But in the last days, people will want doctrines that tickle their ears, that will tell them they're all right. Another uh, false doctrine is that we don't have to repent, that repentance is a one-time thing and then it's over and that uh, any teaching that tells you you have to walk in repentance is doom and gloom. God says, to this one will I look. He who has a broken and contrite spirit and the one who trembles at my word. The walk of repentance is a daily walk where we're walking in humility and as God shows us things in our life that are not right, we repent. We repent continually as he shows us. We repent publicly as much as we need to. We, we continually have that heart toward the Lord. Change my heart, Lord. Make my heart what you want it to be. Uh, another false teaching is that we can't be holy as he is holy. God wouldn't have told us Old Testament and New Testament to be holy as he is holy. Uh, the church members by the multitudes believe the bad report that we can't be holy. And so they just uh, agree to live with the enemies on their land, make peace with the enemies of God on their land. And God wants us to believe that he will be faithful to drive out every one of these enemies as we are fruitful and possess the land. Well, how, do, how are we fruitful and possess the land? We just come into agreement with God when we see anything in our heart that is wrong, when we see any lust, when we see any lie, when we see any deceit, when we see any anger. We call it what God calls it. We call it sin. And we say, God, that is the opposite of holiness, and you have called me to be holy as you're holy. And I'm totally unable and inept, and I can't be holy but you can make me holy. So Lord, I ask you that you would bring your word, you would make your word truth in my heart that I would be holy as you're holy. And we continue, we cry out to him day and night until he makes Israel, the church, me, a praise in the earth. This is not a passive walk that we're in. So don't believe the false doctrine that you can't be holy. Holiness is the normal uh, relationship or, or uh, holiness is, is normality for a child of God. Uh, one of the, another false doctrine is that we don't have to suffer. Many are taught that they, that they suffer, only suffer because they're in sin. God's people have always suffered. God lets some people suffer so that they can be a trophy of grace that he just holds up to the world to say, look at my people how they react to suffering. Uh, many people believe that financial prosperity is a promise. You know, God, Jesus Christ promised that he would take care of every need that we have, that he would take care of food and clothing and shelter. And he said, we ought to be content with those. And, and there's so much false doctrine that causes people's heart to go after greed that will tell you that God wants everybody to be in great financial prosperity. And it's simply not true. I'm confident that God wants all of our needs to be taken care of. And I'm confident that he wants us to have money to give to others, that he does not want the curse of poverty to be on us. But it is false doctrine to get people's eyes on financial prosperity when this whole word is about spiritual prosperity. God wants us to prosper as our soul prospers, but I'll guarantee you he has a whole lot higher priority on our soul prospering than he does on our prospering financially. Another false doctrine is that God is not a God of judgment, 
but just simply love. And if you don't believe that God is a, is a God of judgment, then you're not going to have any fear of God. God's judgment and love are perfectly balanced. He loves us perfectly, but he has to judge sin, all sin in our lives and in the lives of others. Sound doctrine reproves and rebukes and exhorts us. And reprove means to admonish, to convict, and to tell a fault. And as even as I teach the word, the word convicts me. And I pray that it's doing the same with you right now. Uh, sound doctrine will rebuke us. And that means it's from two Greek words. It means to fix, to prize, or to fix a value on and to honor. Because God fixes a prize on us and honors us. He sends this word to rebuke us. And exhort means to call near, to call near to Jesus. Um, Webster says that exhort is to encourage, to embolden, to cheer, and to advise. The primary sense seems to be to give strength, spirit, or courage. courage. And Paul tells us in, in Colossians 1.23 not to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel is the only hope that we have. Unsound doctrine will remove our hope because it will move us into a man-centered religion where we're trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, where we have a 12-point plan whereby we get rid of addictions. No, there's a one-point plan. You come, you respond to Jesus, love, respond to his agape love, and come to him with your whole heart. And as we come to him with our whole heart, then he is the one who does all of these things that must be done in our life. It's not I. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ Jesus who lives within me. I want you to know Christ Jesus doesn't lust. Christ Jesus is not filled with anger. Christ Jesus loves others with agape love even when I couldn't possibly love them. So Jesus is the one who is doing all of the things that need to be done in us. And sound doctrine will give you encouragement. Sound doctrine will give you the comfort of the scriptures. Sound doctrine will always give you hope that he who began a good work in you will be the one who completes it. That faithful is he, Jesus, who called you to himself, and he will also do it. Do what? Sanctify us, body, soul, and spirit, and present us blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is the one who do, does that. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ is the one who called us to his eternal glory, and he is the one who will cause his glory, his nature and character, to be manifested in us and to manifest in us daily. The hope of salvation is Jesus Christ. The hope of salvation is that agape love that was manifested at Calvary that's poured out on us every day. It's, a God, it's his agape love that keeps us from being destroyed by the destroyer. It's his agape love that, that snatches us out of the fire and that causes us to be able to walk in his presence daily. Agape love at Calvary is what causes us to have the hope that we can be born again and that we can become a new creation and that all of the old things will pass away and that he will cause us to endure to the end. We have this promise that he will, he will cause us to endure all things, that he will cause us, because of agape love, to endure to the end. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I want to give you an assurance that Jesus Christ is the only one who can cause you to endure the trials and testings and temptations that you're going through. And he is sitting on that throne of grace right now, looking at you and what you're going through. And he's waiting for you to cry out to him for mercy. And when you cry out to him for mercy, that's one cry that he never, ever fails to hear. Now, he might, may not answer your prayers on the time schedule you have set, but everything will be perfect in his time. God bless you. 
And I pray that you will continue to endure to the end so that you can be saved.